guest. I'm your host, Fabian Gormer. Today, we are joined by Norman Bowie. Norman Bowie is the former Elmer L. Anderson Chair in Corporate Responsibility at the University of Minnesota. He has authored or edited 16 books and over 75 articles. Professor Bowie is the leading scholar in the application of Kant's moral philosophy to business. Today, we will talk in particular about his book, Business Ethics, A Kantian Perspective. Professor Bowie, welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. Pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you so much. So um, maybe to start off, could you maybe briefly tell us a bit uh, about your background uh, for the viewers uh, who, do, who don't know you, don't know you, and uh, how did you get interested in the field of business ethics? Well, uh, I was interested in Kant back when, when I was in college and wrote what I now realize is a very terrible dissertation on uh, Kant's theory of man. And went on into philosophy and it seemed to me that applied ethics was very very important in the early 1970s mm -hmm. but philosophers tended not to like to talk about capitalism so i and i've always enjoyed business and i had done my dissertation on distributive justice and so it was kind of a natural move for me and having always been interested in kant it was a natural move to make his philosophy, uh, the kind of basis of groundwork for my own thinking. Okay, great. That's very interesting. So uh, in this talk, we will be mostly discussing your book, Business Ethics, A Kantian Perspective. And in this first chapter of this book, you talk about Kant's formulation of the categorical imperative. This formulation says, act only on that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. And you furthermore note also that the test of the categorical imperative becomes a principle of fair play. So how can we apply this formulation to uh, the business world and what is the relevance of this formulation to understanding the rules of business? Well, the, the very essential word I think that you just mentioned is the rules of business. And once you have a rule, then the question becomes, should I follow the rule when it's inconvenient? And so Kant would say, well, universalize that into a maxim. Could you act on that maxim universally? And that maxim would be, uh, I'll follow the rule, except when it's inconvenient for me. But if everyone followed that rule and didn't and acted on the rule only when it was convenient, then it wouldn't be a rule mm -hmm. because everybody would be making an exception. And of course, a rule which has an exception for everybody is not a rule. And it's important because business is contractual and there's, it's so rule-based. It just seemed natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and often when we talk about rules, uh, Kant has been kind of accused as being an absolutist in ethics. Uh, and, and in this book, you kind of describe that you think that uh, uh, this isn't the right uh, interpretation and that Kant actually does allow context to play a role. So maybe can you explain what is the role of context for Kant and, and could you maybe give an example in business to illustrate this point? Well, I, th I think we can because it, it, we have to talk about the second formulation of the categorical imperative, but I think is easier to give an example. Mm -hmm. And that formulation said, always treat a person or the humanity in a person as an end and never as a means merely. Mm -hmm. So it's absolute. The rule is absolute or the imperative is absolute in the sense that you can't violate that rule. You can't treat a person merely as a means. But there are lots of ways to treat a person as an end. So in a business context, let's talk about an employee and the business might protect the humanity of a person, or in this case, the employee, by open book management, where the employee learns all the facts. It might be by participative management. It might be through unionization. There are lots of different ways to act that are compatible with imperative. The only actions that are forbidden are those actions which are inconsistent with the, imper with the imperative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they are constrained in some sense, but still after these constraints, there's lots of room still to kind of choose. And in that sense, context play, play, plays a major role. Yeah, another example might be on the other side. I think that the respect for persons principle would mean that the so-called uh, freedom uh, employment at will theory, mm -hmm. it's very operative in American business. That's not acceptable on Kantian grounds. Yeah, because, oh, sorry. because if you say that you can fire anybody for a reason, no reason, a bad reason, a reason, you know, immoral, mm 
no Kantian could accept that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so it does constrain, and it's absolutist in that sense. But on the other hand, there are lots and lots of ways that you can behave in a way which doesn't endorse employment at will. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, and you also talk about kind of the Kantian ethical theory being challenged recently by the behavioral ethics camp. So you do acknowledge that the, the, the relevance of behavioral ethics in business. However, you don't think that it would allow us to do away with normative ethics. So how can we kind of understand how they could maybe complement each other and, and maybe what has been the objections from the behavioral uh, ethicist uh, against the Kantian uh, uh, ethics approach? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm, I'm fascinated by a lot of the work in behavioral ethics because they are looking at things empirically mm -hmm. and you learn a lot about human psychology and philosophers tend not to be psychologists. And so one of the things they've learned is that people often don't make decisions by reasoning it out, by saying, gee, what should I do in this case? Let me take the second formulation of the categorical imperative and see what applies and what doesn't. They say, we can show empirically, people usually don't reason that way. Fair enough. Two points in response. Number one, Kant himself never thought that people always reason that way. He thinks that most people behave ethically and just basically follow the rules they grew up with. Key for Kant was, what do you do in cases where it's hard to know what the ethical decision is? And those famous four examples from the groundwork are examples where you, it's not clear what you ought to do. And in that case, then you do begin to reason about ethics. And what I tell them, the behaviorists have no theory of justification. All they have is they have a theory of are a, a set of empirical results, but they don't have a theory of justification. And if you read their writings, most of the time, most of them just assume what we call ordinary morality. Uh, and, I mean, they have values, but it, I mean, what if it turns out uh, that be, people don't behave the, the way, or at least don't behave the way in a corporation that people do in society? What can the behavioral ethicists say? They have to turn to moral philosophy for justification. So one of the things you also talk about is, uh, 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 and, and you quote here, Christine Korsgaard, that we can distinguish between logical contradiction and a pragmatic contradiction. And in particular, you mentioned that the pragmatic contradiction is very useful for business ethics in particular. So maybe can you explain briefly what those two different sort of contradictions are? And in particular, why is the pragmatic contradiction uh, so useful for the business ethics? Well, logical, the logical contradictions are like the case about, is it okay, is it okay to tell a lie? Mm -hmm. And if you universalize that, the whole notion of truth becomes uh, impossible, mm -hmm. implausible. It's, it's literally a formal contradiction. The, pragma the pragmatic con uh, contradiction really depends on having a certain purpose. Of uh, course, God, the Kantian scholar, does a real good job of, of explaining this. And so if you look at, let's look at something like trust in business, because trust has been very, very uh, important in the strategic management field for years. And so suppose you want to say that your end, your purpose is to make a profit. And then you say, what are the necessary conditions for making a profit? One of those, and let's assume that one of those conditions is that you try to build an organization which is a trusting organization. And by the way, you can show empirically that a trusting organization increases profitability. So then suppose that a management does something which undermines trust. In that way, since, since management has a moral obligation and has it as, as its purpose in a public corporation for profit, and we know empirically that trust is a necessary condition for profitability, and if management then does something, has a maxim which is in contradiction to building trust, they're in a pragmatic contradiction because it undermines the purpose of what they're doing. So the pragmatic contradiction is, uh, is underlying a purpose of the will. And the formal contradiction is really like a logical contradiction.
That's very interesting. And indeed, how it relates to trust, for example, and how that's fundamental and how this rule play, plays a role. And um, I think also it was mentioned that uh, sometimes people say, okay, the business is like a jungle. Uh, but you say, no, if it really be, would be a jungle, then there would be no business world and, and it would disappear very quickly. So I think that's also an, a nice illustration of it. Um, maybe shifting a gears a little bit, you also talk about uh, uh, Kant's respect for person uh, principle. So you state, I believe that if Kant's respect for person's principle were honored, business practice would look very different. Thus, the application of Kantian ethics here calls for a fairly radical reform of business practice. Nonetheless, I shall argue that such reform may actually enhance the bottom line rather than hurt it as business people often suppose. So, so what is this respect for person principle? I think we already talked about it a little bit. And what are the implications for uh, uh, business practice? Because you do say, okay, this might be kind of a radical reform that we're looking at. Right. Well, if you look at a standard textbook in business ethics, uh, I was always struck by the fact that so many of the issues really center on an application of the second formulation, the, the respect for persons formulation. So one way to look at it is to divide it, first of all, with things that might violate the first formulation. So deception and advertising, for example, if you deliberately try to deceive people, uh, you can show by applying the technique of the first formulation that that kind of deception is immoral. Mm -hmm. uh, any kind of coercion, so I think the employment at will, doctor, we've talked about, that also was a violation. Yeah. But then there's always, there's a positive formulation. It's not enough not to disrespect people, to mm -hmm. use them as a means, yeah. but you have positive duties as well. As well. And I think that the, it's the positive duties that are very interesting because it provides for an opportunity to talk about meaningful work in a corporation. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just enough not to arbitrarily dismiss an employee, but there's an obligation to employ and to enhance meaningful work mm -hmm. in an organization. And, and that really opens up a lot of possibilities as to, I mean, I don't know about uh, in, in, the, in the Europe, but in the US we have all these stories that thank, thank God it's Friday, Blue Monday, mm -hmm. Wednesday being hump day. <laughs> and the, 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 it looks like it's getting a job and working sucks. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, if you look at the meaningful work aspect, then the work becomes a team. Uh, work looks more like a family to, in that, that way you're looking at it, or you can talk about it as a, a union of unions or a, a social union, the way Rawls, I think, talk, it was a Kantian, mm -hmm. talked about it. And you have a whole different notion of what work really is. Uh, those of us who were professors, we never understood this, uh, thank God it's Friday thing. I mean, we worked through the weekends so we loved our job. And uh, so in, in the book, I try to develop this notion of, of meaningful work. And it, 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 business would look very different if our metaphors about it changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think family metaphor, that yeah. for example. No, definitely. I think that's very interesting. And you already touched uh, upon a few points that I would like to discuss also later, but indeed maybe making this distinction, okay, there's this uh, positive uh, aspect to it, but also this negative aspect. So maybe focusing on uh, the, the, the negative aspect, just the respecting part. Uh, 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 maybe one example that you talk about is kind of the existence of asymmetric information. So maybe we can focus on that uh, as a specific example, kind of how do we deal with that uh, in order to make sure that managers, for example, don't deceive their employees through this kind of asymmetrical information existing. Yeah. Yeah, I learned from my economics uh, faculty colleagues about asymmetric information. And the more I thought about it, the more I said, boy, a lot of unethical behavior results from unfairly exploiting the fact that one person in the relationship has information that the other person either doesn't have, and in some cases really can't, can't have at all. For example, a doctor-patient relationship. Uh, there are very, very few patients who could possibly have the knowledge. So they really, the doctor really has to be accepted on trust. Mm -hmm. And you do what the doctor says because you think they know something and are dedicated to helping you and not to just give you a, a medicine that they're invested in, which they make money off of. So the goal in business, the, suppose the old model is that it's the boss who has the information mm 
and the employee is just to follow the rules of the boss. Mm -hmm. And but the boss has all the information, all the financial information. So it, it, outside of business ethics, uh, some organizational theorists and actually uh, some actual managers came up with this notion of open book management. And in open book management, you give the employees all the financial information. And when in doing that, that First of all, it eliminates the information asymmetry because now the employees have the information. And then, since the employees aren't treated like a herd, but now they can act on the information on the line and their own profitability and all the rest, because it's often bonus-based and, and profitability-based compensation, they can actually make decisions and they're invested in the community. And basically, it, it turns everybody in the firm into a financial analysis. Everybody becomes a CEO, mm. COO. That's and funny. that tra that transforms the, the business and it's been very successful. It's obviously easier to do it in a small organization, but even some large organizations like Intel, if I remember correctly, they've done things that move in a direction of eliminating information asymmetry. Hmm, that's very interesting indeed. And, and maybe uh, related to this, kind of, you also talk about kind of companies' ethics programs that indeed maybe many kind of uh, uh, have this kind of model where it's top down uh, uh, related to kind of uh, the ethics, so kind of it's imposed on, on, on the, the, the lower ranks, for example, in a company. And, and you think uh, uh, that this would indeed treat them merely uh, uh, as a means to an end. So could you maybe sketch out a, a, a kind of ideal Kantian informed ethics program? What kind of what would that look like? <laughs> Well, it, it, most of it would be process because again, there can be many different kinds of ethics programs that I think would pass the Kantian test, mm -hmm. but there were a process uh, decisions that are made that wouldn't pass. And I mean, the first thing, how, again, very common business question, how do you get buy-in on an ethics program? You got, they have to believe in it. Well, why would people buy into a program if it's just ordered? from the boss on down. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, in the development of an ethics program for a corporation, the individual employees and all the stakeholders really should have a say in the making of it. And in that way, it it's, gets buy-in across the corporation and it's taken more seriously. Otherwise, what, what do people say? Oh yes, today's ethics day. Once a year we have a program, we're gonna to listen to all this BS, which by the way, the management never follows themselves. They're such hypocrites. And what you wanna do is to kind of reverse that whole way of thinking about ethics programs. And so that in a sense, everyone becomes an ethical agent. And mm -hmm. to become an ethical agent, you have to go through the process of uh, engaging and negotiating what the ethics program will be. That and, and, and that's what Scott Reynolds and I try to argue in that, in that article that we, we cite in the book. Or I that's, cite. Very, that's very interesting. And, and this also relates, I think, to just the democratization of the, the, the work uh, uh, floor that this kind of fully fits into kind of that thesis, what you just talked about. Yeah. Yes, Europe, Europe in many ways is a model of which I could draw upon mm -hmm. to, if I knew more about it, but certainly Germany, for example, with the labor as seats on the board and things like mm -hmm. that. That's all part of this way of integrating all the stakeholders and particularly the employees mm -hmm. into the into the corporation and i think in improving performance that's very interesting yeah actually and maybe one one thought that comes to mind also that i noticed from your book is you talk about a kind of a kantian model of leadership so maybe a lot of people thinking about leadership in the business world they might indeed think about someone like elon musk or, or bill gates but but you, you have a kind of a different model like what would make a good kantian leader uh, can you maybe elaborate on that Yes, actually, I, I got into that it, partly through Kant, but partly through I was, there's a famous Harvard case called ABB Relays, which is a European case. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in that case, which wasn't designed, it was designed to teach matrix organization. I didn't use it for that. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to teach leadership. And what happens in the case is that the CEO it, it, it is the, appears to be the center of the, of the case. Mm -hmm. He's going to make a decision. So what he does is he says, all right, we have this problem. I'm the CEO. CEO. I recognize this problem. 
I'm not going to assign it to somebody else. So that person then becomes the leader mm -hmm. and, and doesn't report back that the person who he was assigned to, that's his job to do it. But that person, and it, it goes down the line until there's this debate about marketing between, I think it's Latin America and, some, and, and part of Europe. Mm -hmm. And they can't, and it has to be a decision. There are three people involved. And we're now four steps down in the organization. And uh, they can't make a decision. So what do they do? They come back and say, we can't agree. Well, in normally what would happen is the boss then makes the decision. But in this case, the boss says, go back and come back with a decision. You've got to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Notice you're driving leadership down the organization all the way down. So they go and they have a meeting and it comes back two to one. And the boss says to the three, I don't want a two to one. I want it unanimous. And so they go back and they have to hot iron out a unanimous de decision. Notice how, first of all, all the autonomy that's given every, every step down the organization. In a sense, what a, in a sense, what a leader de does is to turn everybody into a leader with respect to their particular function. Yeah, that's very interesting indeed. I think that that kind of is a very different uh, approach to leadership that maybe many people hold or, or, or think about when they think about leaders. But I think that's a very interesting take. How can you need, enable others to be uh, more autonomous, make decisions, et cetera? And how can you spread kind of that model throughout the organization? So yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, maybe also before you kind of already uh, uh, hinted at uh, the advertising kind of uh, uh, question, uh, some people think that, that advertisement is kind of fundamentally uh, deceptive. Uh, so what would you uh, say about kind of uh, uh, those claims? Do you think it's fundamentally deceptive or indeed how can we make sense of, of, of advertisement related to kind of deception? To, uh, with respect to deception? Mm -hmm. Well, de deceptions, that's really a complicated one. If I, if I could write another book, you could write a whole book on deception because there are some kinds of statements that are made that people say are deceptive, but they're not because everybody knows that it's just hyperbole. I mean, th this is really relevant in advertising. Mm -hmm. So, but so the question is, when do you move from making claims that everybody knows is just hyperbole mm -hmm. to a claim that's really deceptive? And one of the problems that you need to take a look at is who's what's your baseline? Is your baseline going to be the ideal rational person? Or is the baseline going to be the ordinary consumer? Or is the baseline going to be the most ignorant consumer? Mm -hmm. And in law, it's tended to be something between the most rational consumer and the ordinary consumer. Uh, I think instead of using psychology to figure out how to trick people, they should use psychology in business to figure out what your kind of baseline ordinary consumer is like. And then make sure that you don't do anything to deceive that consumer. And that, and that would be some big changes. Uh, you have a package and you reduce the amount of content. Ever notice in some packages where it says 16 ounces and you open it up and the box is only two thirds full. Yeah. It's got 16 ounces, right? Mm -hmm. But or you make it a you make it a bigger box, but it still has. It used to be a smaller box with sixteen ounces. Now it's got a bigger box, mm -hmm. and they even know which colors people are going to respond to in a way. And and I, I can't even gets nervous about that kind of stuff. And in some cases, just outright deception. Yeah, that's right. It's very tricky. It's a lot. There are a lot of gray areas in, in deception, and particularly, I think, in deceptive advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you also mentioned in the book, even looking at kind of uh, kind of cultural factors, etc., also play a role in just kind of understanding indeed maybe how someone can be deceived or even how that kind of person enters uh, kind of or, or perceives it from their own perspective. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Culture plays a big role. And just a quick point on that to add to it. And in that sense, you can see people criticize Kant because they think it's absolutist, as you said. And here's a case where a Kantian would say, yeah, you need to take into account the culture. Something which would deceive people in one culture might not deceive them in another culture. Yeah, and, exactly. that, and that way, Kant really, ethics really is, it does have a situational component to it. Mm -hmm. 
switching a, a little bit. So you state uh, for a Kantian, the two contribution of capitalism would be that it provides jobs that help provide self-respect. I thought this was an, an interesting quote. So can you maybe elaborate on this quote? In, in what sense do we need jobs in order to get that sense of self-respect? Some people might say, of course, jobs can contribute to it, but it's not kind of an essential factor in order to get that notion of self-respect. Well, self-respect, if you're on the, let me give you an example I saw on television last night from the pandemic. Uh, they had a special feature uh, on NBC News about in, being inside the Clorox plant. Mm -hmm. And they were, one of the problems we're having in the States is making enough Clorox <laughs> to, for disinfectant. And they're running that factory 24 seven maximum employee participation all the time. And a woman at the end said, you know, I feel so much better now. I used to think we were just making disinfectant. Now I'm saving lives. And you just knew they looked on that business in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. And it became, this ties in onto meaningful work, obviously. Yeah. It, it said, wow, we're helping save lives. And I remember going to the early, early on when we started the problem here in the States and I went to the local grocery store and they were just starting now to, we didn't have even required to stay at home yet, but we just knew there were problems out there. Mm -hmm. And I said to the, the grocery clerk, I said, so did you ever think you'd be a hero? And the person looked at me and then said, no. Mm -hmm. But then you could just see him straighten up and yeah, I'm doing something heroic. And they were probably making the minimum wage mm -hmm. yeah, and really just felt put upon. And of course it was busy and crowded and people were trying to hoard stuff and all that. And it went from being a despicable job to get through all this to say, no, I'm saying I'm a hero. Mm -hmm. I'm making it possible for people to have things gonna need during this pandemic. This transforms an organization. That's very interesting. And you think in general, like kind of this self-realization, okay, there is this respect uh, for your job, that that kind of is, is something that can be kind of brought into kind of all jobs, that all jobs might, uh, or at least most jobs might have this aspect where indeed we can say, okay, it brings this self-respect and therefore it is kind of a crucial component that we ought to respect. Right. So it, some jobs, we should really try to find technology to replace. They, mm -hmm. I mean, they really are crappy jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't think every job can be transformed, but you sure can make an effort. I mean, we used to call people garbage collectors and now they're sanitary engineers. Mm -hmm. And uh, would it be better if we could find a machine that would correct certain things? Uh, so in those cases, yes. I think there are jobs that would be nice to get rid of and let machines or robots do them. But we could do a lot better at making people feel important. It's just, See, some of that bo me boss, you worker mentality, mm -hmm. right away that undermines the notion that mm -hmm. the job is significant and the job is important. And that's why these pieces, Kantian theory of capitalism is very coherent, I think. I mean, you, mm -hmm. really, you really can, when you, when, you, when you build the model from the perspective of them, look at actual business practice, it's, it's remarkably coherent. That's very, the show. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. And, and, and maybe one last thing in kind of the, the, the context of what we've been discussing is kind of indeed we'll be talking about meaningful work, but also in your book, you, you lay out some other people will talk about worthy work. So, so maybe that's kind of a, a last distinction that we can kind of discuss in what sense is a, a difference between meaningful work and your kind of Kantian theory of meaningful work and others talking about kind of worthy work. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joanne Chuler, as I recall, talks about worthy work. And, she really, going back to the, one of the questions you asked me, she really thinks that meaningful work is really needs to be applied to jobs that are significant. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, firefighters, doctors, teachers are significant. And there are lots of jobs, maybe like working in McDonald's, that aren't significant, although that's not her example. And I think that's, just, I myself think that's just too, uh, too, much, too elitist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I admit that certain, as I just said, certain jobs maybe should be replaced, but most jobs can be formulated in a way and treated in such a way mm -hmm. that you can get realization out of it. 
Uh, some that's are harder than others. Yeah, I see. But that's kind of the minimal condition. If you can get that out of a job, then it does kind of serve its purpose, so to speak. Yes. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, also, you talk about kind of uh, Milton Friedman uh, challenging the notion that you could speak of uh, corporate social responsibility because a corporation is not, on Friedman's view, uh, a moral agent. So, so you discuss quite a, a bit about this as well in, in your book. So how do you respond to such a challenge? How can we get to kind of a notion of agency that, that does the right work? Yeah, well, in, in the first edition of the book, Fabian, I, I just punted on the whole question because it's, it's so incredibly complicated, mm -hmm. but it's such a key area of business ethics. Uh, I said, I got to do something about it. To be honest, I, I don't know which theory of corporate agency is right, but let's start. So I had to, let's start with Kant. First of all, Kant talks about organizations. There were no corporations in Kant's day, mm -hmm. but he talks about states in perpetual peace having duties. So it, sound, it sounds as if Kant either was talking informally the way we always do, mm -hmm. Kant seldom talks informally, or he, he really just assumes that you can talk about states being agents. And we have to remember that Kant was influenced by Rousseau. Mm -hmm. And Rousseau had this notion of the general will, which is above something beyond the will of every individual. And so, there is a sense in which Kant seems to think, gee, uh, it's okay to be talking about agency, but he never develops a theory. Mm -hmm. So when Manny Velasquez and others uh, challenged this notion of corporate agency early back in the 70s, uh, Peter French came up with the argument of uh, corporate uh, decision structure mm -hmm. and tried to, tried to build on a notion of corporate intentionality. Mm -hmm. And it was criticized that literature was he was criticized in this big literature about that and then bratman not operating in business ethics but uh, professor bratman came along with a notion of a plan and talked about planning mm -hmm. and a plan seems to be bigger than any in the plan of any individual so dennis arnold who's a business ethics uh, professor and former student of mine developed a, a notion of planning in the corporation that involved ethical planning mm. and we do talk about the corporation's strategy and if you tie ethics to strategy as i do and most good business ethics is doing now then if it makes sense to talk about a corporate strategy and ethics as part of that strategy then don't you have enough intentionality uh, Kendi Hess has actually come up with the notion that corporations really have a kind of intentionality. Uh, that's not specifically Kantian, but it fits Kantianism. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a woman, who, uh, Amy MacArthur, who actually tried to develop a theory of Kantian intentionality. Mm -hmm. So, and I just simply say, look, if you try A, take Bratman's theory. If you think that doesn't work, try B, <laughs> try C. And you run down, you run them all down. Maybe you could give a Kantian transcendental argument for agency and say, look, if we're going to talk about corporate ethics, we have to treat a corporation as if it were an agent. Much mm -hmm. the way Kant says, if we're going to talk about ethics, we have to talk about a human being as if they were free. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Same strategy. Yeah, and you even say if you don't accept all these views, you can still kind of keep to a kind of pragmatic viewpoint where you say, okay, it's just useful to kind of talk in this way and, and kind of work it out. So, so that's kind of a last resort. That's right, and the law and the law does this, in fact. Yeah, the exactly. Kind of the legal case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, one other thing that you talk about also is, is the paradox of profit. So maybe this is also interesting. Kind of what is this paradox, and, and, and what is the relevance of it? Well, if you. It, <laughs> When I was teaching in the business school, uh, all I ever heard about was focus on profits, focus on profit, focus on profit. And oftentimes when you, the next step would be, so if the cost of employers, employees go up, cut your staff. Or if the cost of advertising goes up, cut advertising. Mm -hmm. And the, it seemed to me that the mistake that was often made is you over downsize or you cut the wrong things. Maybe what you should focus on are taking care of all the stakeholders mm 
meeting all their needs if you meet and, and a consumer being one of the stakeholders if you meet those needs you will then be profitable so if you focus just on the bottom line, you'll often make decisions which ultimately undermine profit. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you focus on the stakeholders and focus on them, you'll be successful at that endeavor and that will let you enhance profit. Mm -hmm. So that's the paradox. The more you focus on profit, the less likely you are to get it. The more you focus on things other than profit on the stockholders, the more likely you are to be profitable. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And also, uh, does this kind of short-term versus long-term kind of play a role here that in some sense kind of, it's also all about like how sustainable is kind of this model. And if we include all stakeholders, then it just works as a kind of more sustainable model that works in the end as kind of the long-term profit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I, I like to think that Kantian moral philosophy when it's applied to business really fits nicely with uh, all the good theories in management and human resources and basically the business disciplines. Mm -hmm. Hmm, very interesting. And, and also, um, of course, we've been talking about uh, capitalism and, and you in particular talk about a Kantian theory of, of capitalism. And then in particular, you also focus on kind of the insight that seeking a profit is indeed a moral obligation. And even more interestingly, it is a kind of perfect duty. And then besides that, you discuss kind of the corporate uh, duty of beneficence. And then kind of you say, okay, what is a Kantian theory of uh, capitalism? And then how do we kind of uh, uh, understand the perfect duty of, of profit seeking and then also the imperfect duty of beneficence? So I know this is a kind of a big question, but like how do we kind of balance these two things? Yeah, I've been, I've been working, I worked on that for over 20 years and I, I finally, unlike the agency problem, I finally think I have my own answer to, to, to this particular issue. So it really started off, a lot of my friends and colleagues in the, in the field said, look, I don't understand this duty for duty's sake. Mm -hmm. And besides, if you think, if Kant says that in order for something to be morally worthwhile, it has to be done from duty. And if a co corporation is always looking at profit, then Kantian ethics can't apply, mm -hmm. which means my whole life project goes down the drain. So it, I realized, wait a minute, in a public corporation or even in a partnership, the, the goal is success or profit. Mm -hmm. And in a public corporation, it's a contractual obligation. Think of Friedman. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to maximize profits for stockholders. Mm -hmm. That's a fiduciary contractual obligation. Business law in the U.S. looks at it that way. Well, a contract is a kind of promise. Mm -hmm. And keeping your promises is a perfect duty for Khan. So the dilemma appears because the average person, when they think of profit, they think of it in terms of somehow being against or separate from ethics. Mm -hmm. But if you look at corporate law and if you look at what the purpose of a corporation is, it is to make a profit. And so it's a perfect duty. So the obligation of the manager of a co public corporation is to make a profit. So now I've got my perfect duty. The question is, what, ha what about doing good things? What about corporate CSR in mm -hmm. the European context? What about that? Well, we also know from Kant's philosophy, there's an imperfect duty. And that is the duty of beneficence. So, so how does that apply in the corporate context? Well, one of the problems with Kant's duty of beneficence is how extensive is it? And we also know from Kant's philosophy that an imperfect duty doesn't, it, to, to fulfill an imperfect duty, you can't do it by violating a perfect duty. Mm -hmm. So back in the corporate context, how should you, how should you organize your beneficence, your, your CSR, your corporate philanthropy in the U.S.? Yes. You should organize that philanthropy so it's consistent with your corporate purpose. So if you're a medical company, you don't need to go and give money to Habitat for Humanity, but you might want to give cheaper drugs to third world countries. So in that way, your, your, street, your strategy in terms of your profitability and your beneficence are aligned. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you can't do everything. No corporation can do everything in terms of, profit, in terms of beneficence. So what do you do? Mm 
you do the things that make strategic sense given the kind of corporation you are. And so in business ethics, you actually have a very good way of harmonizing Kant's perfect duties, which in this mm -hmm. case is due to keep your contract of profit, profitability. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you can also have a strategy for the most effective use of your obligation for beneficence. Yeah, that's very interesting indeed, because indeed some intuitions might be indeed, okay, if we are kind of this profit-seeking uh, enterprise, then indeed we don't have a place for it, but kind of you're arguing, no, actually, if we do that, then this kind of fits into it, uh, 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 where it, it makes perfect sense, where we can kind of do both. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Very, very interesting. And it and gives you a nice Kantian ground, grounding for CSR. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm, that's very interesting. And, and maybe kind of my, my final question, and kind of in the final part of your book, you argue that international Kantian capitalism, and more specifically kind of Kantian run multinational corporations, can contribute to universal rights, democracy, and world peace. So how do you support these claims? You, you mentioned also in the book that you were more optimistic 30 years ago about this, but that there's still a case to be made. So maybe that's kind of a final big question. Right. Well, at the very end of the last century, uh, we were all internationalists and globalists. Uh, and uh, Fukuyama wrote this famous book called The End of History in the Last Man. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, the 21st century has blown that to bits. Uh, but, you know, I, I was inspired by Kant's Enlightenment philosophy. And it, Enlightenment philosophy, which is 18th century philosophy, is so, was so cosmopolitan mm -hmm. uh, in ways that... It, really quite remarkable given the economic development at the time. And there are different ways in which it, it can fit. Uh, first of all, you tend, not, you tend not to go to war with people you're doing business with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a good business plan. And, and people, not just Kant, but David Hume, Adam Smith, a lot of the enlightened people realize that. And uh, I think this uh, still in this era, this era of real, real tension, uh, if you can find compatible economic arrangements, it really undercuts some of the other tensions that result from either differences in religion or political ambition or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we also know that capitalism, uh, unlike if you if you have a theory of state capitalism where the state is both organizes the the politics, mm -hmm. the government, and it, the business is part of government, then every decision that gets made where someone disagrees, they're out of step. But in, in a capitalist model, you try to limit the number of decisions that the state has to make. Mm -hmm. I mean, why does a state have to decide uh, how many apples to grow as opposed to how many oranges to grow? Let, let, let the market decide that. Mm -hmm. Because if the state decided it and they decide for more apples, the orange growers are going to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. So that's another way it contributes. And then when we think about our obligations of the rich to the of societies, to the poorer societies, you think about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. uh, this all, and you think about the cr criticisms of sweatshops. Uh, and you think about, well, Human rights claims, how are they grounded? Well, they have to be grounded on the respect for persons principle. Mm -hmm. So since Kantian principles are universal mm -hmm. and human rights claims are claims that are grounded in respect for persons, they also are universal. And then you work on mechanisms and part of those are market mechanisms and mechanisms of international trade and international cooperation and international organizations like the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And you, co you come up with kind of a more harmonious, uh, peaceful working, economic working uh, view of uh, international capitalism, mm -hmm. which 30 years ago I thought was the clear wave of the future. Now it's, well, it has to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Yes. So, Professor Bowie, this has been so great to have you on the podcast. I enjoyed it a lot. So, do you have any uh, parting words to the audience? Well, I first of all, I'm just so delighted to find younger people interested <laughs> in applying in what Kant has to contribute to business ethics. Uh, it was I've been retired for 11 years, so this mm -hmm. was a, a real pleasure for me to have to see if I could still think on my feet at all. <laughs> and a pleasure to meet you, and I wish you the very best.
in a future podcast. Yes, great. Thank you.